Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, uh, it doesn't need any introduction um, that this is going to be an industry uh, session and the industry session would be on uh, Hoya. Um, I'm here to speak on the Vivinex Storic and um, my experience with it uh, for the last year or so, since the time it was launched. Before we go into the IOL proper and discuss about the nitty gritties and the different angulations that, uh, that form and assemble to uh, bring out a complete product to us in the industry, I would just like to out outline the way I go when I choose a particular manufacturer, a particular IOL to be incorporated into my practice. Why this is important is because when we get visits from the manufacturing houses that work with us in the industry, sometimes we face uh, quite unprecedented pushes from them so as to incorporate the ATIOs because all the manufacturing hubs, manufacturing uh, companies right now are coming in with the monofocals and the ATIOs together and the focus product is always on the ATIOs and not the monofocals. In my case, it's always the reverse. When I incorporate a particular product or a particular manufacturing house into my practice, I always go this way. There are three steps. I first try and test their monofocals. If they satisfy me, I go to the next segment, which is the Torix. And then if I'm satisfied with both of these, then I go to the third segment, which are the trifocals and EDOS. Now, Hoya, along with a few other very selected houses, have done a wonderful job in coming out with the monofocals first, ensuring that it has an established platform with the practitioners, and then went into the Torix. And once they knew that the monofocals and the Torix are both satisfying the customers, or the practitioners, then they would venture into the trifocals. You know, they're, yet, they're yet to be uh, launched officially in India and started being used clinically, but they're coming with it very soon because they knew that these two former segments have been able to satisfy. In the monofocal segment, what we look at is the material, the implantation science that goes behind it, and most important of all, the rotational, uh, the st not the rotational, the behavior of the IOL inside the bag after its implant. If we observe the IOL's behavior for the next six months, how is it behaving? Is there any refraction drift? Is there any astigmatic drift from the time when we saw the patient for the first time after surgery, after two weeks? So over a period of time, in six months or so, it should be stable and there should not be any refractive surprises or drifts. That is very important when we go to the next segment of Torix and then on to the trifocals and the EDOF. So that's exactly what happened in my case. I tried the, the iCERT and the Vivinex multi-cert first. I was very happy with the way it behaved post-operatively inside the bag, inside the eye. Then I went on to the Torix. I was very happy with the Torix. Now I'm ready and eagerly waiting for the trifocals to be available in my inventory so that I can go to the next segment. So that's how it's been in my case. So that's how I, I desire should be in everybody's case. Now let's come back to the subject proper. So this is the IOL that we are going to discuss about briefly. However, this particular design of, uh, uh, design of uh, IOL assembly is the iCERT platform where it was just the rotation that was pushing the IOLN. They're also coming in with the multi-cert assembly in the Toric platform where you can push or rotate or screw whatever is, uh, uh, is your choice. It is a preloaded like all other IOLs in, in, their, uh, uh, in their portfolio. Uh, nothing about the material. It, we, we all know that anybody who has got an experience of using, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Sonu would also agree with me and he'll be coming up with his next talk, what the material quality is like. It is outstanding optical quality, very minimal water content, and it's very clear. I think Bivinex is one of those IOLs um, in fact, there's just one other IOL that's there in the market. You know, when you ask the patient to sit in front of the optical biometer and you do not tell the optical biometer that it's a pseudo eye, you do not tell the optical biometer that it's a pseudo eye, the optical biometer automatically changes its mode into pseudo mode, particularly the IOL Master 700. It always recognizes there is an IOL inside, you know, so it changes the mode to the pseudo mode. Vivinex is one IOL wherein if you ask the patient to sit in front of the IL Master 700 and 
and take the measurement, the machine does not recognize that there's an IOL in place. It is so clear that it behaves like the natural crystalline lens. So it stays on the phakic mode. It does not transform into the pseudo phakic mode automatically. You have to choose it manually. Otherwise, it, the machine does not recognize that there is an IOL in place. So what I mean to say by this is the material quality is excellent. It is very, very clear. And uh, when you implant it, the unfolding speed is just optimal. It is neither too long nor too short. The other thing that goes into the implantation science of this is when you fold the, and, and it automatically folds both the haptics onto the optic surface, but the moment it goes into the eye, it never sticks to the optic surface. Perhaps one of the reasons why it does not happen is because of the textured haptic that, is, that has come out in the torix, but it's also not there in the monofocal. I don't know something has gone in which, is, which does not produce the typical salami sign that we have a tough time separating the haptics from the optic, particularly in winters uh, with the help of visco. It never ever happens with this and it unfolds. There are faint stretch marks and at times one or two, but they disappear within seconds, 10 seconds and they disappear and it stays uh, like that. It is glistening free as a material. It has a proprietary design all the IOLs shift in the bag after implantation, maybe minimally by a degree of maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.3 millimeters, but still they're likely to reduce a bit of lower and higher order aberrations if they shift from the optical axis. But this, even if it shifts, it has a tremendous resistance not to produce any coma. I have tested this with the help of eye trace, both pre-op and post-op. Believe me, they remain terrifically stable. I'm not saying it's a huge factor, but if an IOL induces higher order aberrations later on, the quality of vision on, from the patient's perspective does go down. Even if it's by, a, by an iota, it does go down. So the quality of vision is maintained after implantation as well. The median rotation is not at all there. Uh, this is also the refraction stability and the astigmatic stability post implantation is superb. It has a textured haptic which additionally controls the uh, the uh, rotational stability or uh, mimics or dictates the additional rotational stability. Now, it's very interesting that when I, when you implant the IOL, and I implant all my IOLs under BSS, I don't use viscoelastics, particularly for torics, it is very surprising to see all the IOLs rotate in the clockwise direction. It is, it is mandated or it is advisable to rotate them in a clockwise direction and align them along the desired implantation axis. The Vivenex Toric rotates with ease clockwise. It also rotates with equal ease anti-clockwise. So even if you are off axis by 10 degrees and you don't want to rotate the IOL all the way, particularly if you think that the zonular support is not that good, you can comfortably rotate it anti-clockwise those 10 degrees and align it. It rotates anti-clockwise so beautifully that for a moment I thought how good the rotational stability would be post-operative, you know. It was rotating so beautifully anti-clockwise. So I thought it might not be very stable inside the bag, but surprisingly my thoughts were wrong. Even if it rotates beautifully when you implant it or are trying to align it, post-operatively the rotation does not happen this way or that way. So stability is wonderful. I think the textured surface of the haptics do play a role, do play a significant role in contributing to this. So this is just a comparison and as we can see, the Vivinex is, uh, uh, is doing pretty well here. The mean post-op rotation stands at 4.5 degrees and if the toric IOL does not rotate more than 10, more than or equal to 10 degrees, there's no significant change, particularly in the spectacle plane uh, and the patient can stay happy for years together. This is another outcome study uh, which showed that it, uh, the rotation stability in comparison to the other leading uh, platforms of toric IOLs in the industry is pretty good and acceptable. This is what I was talking to you about. The coma in the post-operative period in a pseudo eye always comes in if there's an IOL tilt or an IOL shift. But the coma in this case, I did not believe this slide unless and until I saw it for myself. So I, I did a comparative observation between the pre-op coma and the post-op coma in a lot of implanted patients and I found that it actually does not induce any coma at all. And as I said, if the higher order aberrations, if the coma is 0.3 pre-op and even if it increases to 0.5 post-op, 
the patient might not reduce quantitative vision, it might still remain 6 by 6, but qualitatively the patient might just do the bit of, lose a bit of clarity and contrast in the outcome. Uh, so this is how it is achieved, the aspheric design, it is proprietary. I really uh, have not gone into the details of what is the proprietary design and how does it resist that, but it does resist that beautifully. Uh, so this is, as we were uh, discussing a while earlier, this is the uh, iCERT platform wherein you had this hub which used to be screwed. So had a, I had a little bit of an issue initially because I implant all my IELTS under BSA, so my left hand is not free to rotate this, so my assistant always uh, screws it in. And if you don't screw it in yourself, you would not have, I mean, this, this is another user dependence which comes in. But with the multi-cert platform which is available now, you can choose to push it in and the push technology is even smoother than the, the screwing in technology uh, with this particular assembly, I believe. Uh, so this is how it is, I mean, there are three steps, very, very easy, put in Visco, dislodge the lock, then uh, disassemble the assembly, I mean, take out the whole cartridge thing from its holder and then just advance the plunger so that it, the, the bifid plunger takes the trailing haptic along with it, folds it onto the optic surface. The nozzle is beautifully designed again. There's a, there's a notch which folds the advancing haptic onto the optic surface and then it is ready to go in and uh, uh, occupy its place in the back. Toric calculators, well, Haya has its own. Every manufacturing company has its own toric calculator. You can choose to use the calculator which is inbuilt in your optical biometer or the various calculators that are available online, all of them being free. And all of them now have the Barrett's uh, toric calculator incorporated, so uh, it hardly makes a difference which calculator do you use. They all sing the same song essentially. However, if there is a difference, my recommendation would be if there is a difference between different calculators so as to predict which model of toric should go in, it's always advisable to rely on the online calculator finally because that's the most advanced one and that's the most uh, updated one. So the algorithms keep changing and uh, Dr. Barrett always updates that in the online platform. So it's always better to zero in on the online calculator should there be a difference uh, in, the, uh, in the different uh, calculating formulae. So this is how the IL looks like. It's not anything hugely different from what we have already seen thus far, but the only thing that changes is the textured rough haptic surface out here. And then the alignment uh, uh, holes, the alignment holes on the optic surface are very prominent and big. They sometimes are important, particularly if you're handling a case which is a small pupil and you're trying to align a toric aisle along a small pupil, these very prominent deep holes actually help you see the uh, holes, the, see the lines and uh, enable you to align them properly along the desired axis. So they really come in handy. Uh, at, at certain times, not always maybe, but at certain times, say in hazy cornea or small pupils, they actually help you a lot. Not a huge difference, but still it is a difference. And then the optic surface is smooth and it's a thin and textured optic edge. These are of course the advantages uh, that are there. The power range that is available is from plus 6 to plus 30 and the, uh, the estimated range is from T2 to T9, so it's, it starts from 1 on the IL plane, which corrects them to 0.5 in the spectacle plane and 0.75 on the corneal plane. T2 and T3 would have a difference of uh, uh, 0.5 adapters between them and then when you go on from T3 onwards it will be ha having a 0.75 difference. Now there has been a lot of talk amongst ourselves should there be a, a less of a difference between the spherical range and the cylindrical range meaning the spherical, uh, should there be increments up to 0.25 between the spherical paths and 0.5 essentially in the, in the cylindrical paths in the torics, but it hardly makes any difference actually because the residual astigmatism on the spectacle uh, plane extrapolates onto somewhat, somewhat like 0 0.15 to 0 0.2. That's not even amenable to get corrected with glasses, so it hardly makes a difference if it's brought down to 0.5. However, there are, are a lot of things that you must consider one of those is the toricity ratio. So if you have a, a higher spherical power, then you need to correct the uh, astigmatism lower on the hypermetropic side and higher on the, on the myopic side. So the toricity ratio should always be kept in mind. Dr. Barrett has done a wonderful job again to incorporate the toricity ratio in his algorithm, in his calculator, but still it is always better to refer the chart of toricity ratio and find out where, how close you are to the 
predicted values. Um, so that's also something that we must. Uh, so the key highlighting feature of this particular product is one, two, three. If I count, then the material quality is superb. It gives you excellent refraction stability in terms of the spherical residual post-operatively over a period of time. The rotational stability is very good. It has textured haptics. The rotational stability is very good. And the, to rotate it inside the bag, also it is pretty, pretty smooth and, and easy. Prominent optic uh, prom pro prominent alignment holes so that you can align them exactly along the axis wherever you want to leave them. And of course, not to mention Hoya's fantastic, fantastic implantation science. The way it has been designed and developed is absolutely commendable. So uh, I think uh, in a nutshell, this is all about, I have uh, implanted, I don't know, I've, I've lost the count, I cannot tell you in numbers, but um, it's, it's close to around 40 to 50 in a month from this particular manufacturer. And I cannot say that I have, uh, I have even a single recorded refractive surprise, so to speak, uh, in the post-operative period thus far. Fingers crossed, it's still in the evaluation process. Of course, I, I cannot say that I've implanted thousands and I'm, I'm concluding that it's perhaps the best, but still, it definitely ranks as one of the best and promises to be um, really, really satisfactory, both for the practitioner and for the patient. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention.